Welcome everyone. My name is Terry Ross and I'm the director of the Hunter Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation. On behalf of the Haskin School of Business, I will warmly welcome you all to Corporate Innovation Day as part of Innovation Week and Global Entrepreneurship Week. Thank you for joining us today for conversation and insights about corporate innovation within our organizations. The Hunter Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation believes that our community has unrealized entrepreneurial and innovative thinking skills and today has been a focused effort to work on that. The bottom line is, it's really hard to execute the business model of today, let alone the business model of tomorrow. But the reality of our common situation is that that's the case, we got to do this. So let's choose to look forward to innovating from within as a way of generating new wealth and new opportunities to improve ourselves for all. The Hunter Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation is pleased to partner on today's event with the Global Business Futures Initiative, BG Gover, Gover Indigen, Asking Executive Education, Platform Calgary, and Etch. Welcome to you all. The University of Calgary gratefully acknowledges that this event is not only being held in cyberspace, but also on the traditional territories of the people of the Treaty 7 region of Southern Alberta, which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy, the Tutsina First Nation, and the Stony Nakoda. The city of Calgary is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. Now, today's session is a workshop that will focus on how sustainable procurement can be leveraged to link your spend categories with direct impact measures and sustainable development goals of the United Nation in a manner that can be tracked and reported. Our presenters today, Jane Jong and Guillaume Boisser, bring almost 20 years of cross-sectoral experience across areas like agriculture, aerospace, finance, pharmaceuticals, oil and gas, and large telecommunications. And Jane is also an instructor at the Haskane School of Business. So please help me welcome Jane and Guillaume. Jane? Fantastic. Thank you so much for that fantastic introduction, Terry. And a big thank you for yourself and your entire team for organizing this fantastic day. Um, for everyone who's made it this far in the day, well done. Welcome to your last session. So we are actually here today to share with you um, a topic that's very near and dear to my heart, really leveraging the power of procurement to drive innovation and sustainability within organizations. My co-founder and I, Guillaume, we started edge sourcing about four years ago. And um, before that, we come from industry. So we spend a long time in the procurement field. And about two years ago is really when we started formalizing our approach to sustainable procurement and really identifying it as something to fulfill a need in the marketplace to connect the bridge between sustainable objectives and corporate value. And so that's what we're really excited to share and spread the word about. Um, and we're really excited that we can be here to go through this process with you. We know it's the last session of the day, so we'll keep our talk talking points fairly brief. And what we'll do is we'll start with an overview of what procurement is. We know we've got a little bit of a mixed audience here today. So to make sure that we're all on the same page, what exactly is procurement? It's one of the fields that I personally have a lot of love for in the corporate environment. And we'll talk about opportunities to really innovate in the procurement space. And then we'll connect it into how sustainability really fits into this whole story, how sustainability really comes in and connects to establish those links and drive and show you guys our sustainable procurement model, what we actually use today with our clients in this space. And lastly, we'll close off with a procurement um, case study around sustainable procurement. There are so many opportunities, so many projects that we've run over the past. We've really picked one that's very close to our hearts and um, something that we're very proud of that we've worked on ourselves. And then we'll close with a discussion activity. So to get ourselves started, I really want all of you to start thinking about um, areas that your organization are spending in. So think of an area that you're currently spending in um, that you think could be worth exploring in terms of how you're currently spending, what and how you can be spending this uh, funding a little bit better uh, in terms of driving sustainability objectives. So starting with that, hold that thought in your mind as we go through the presentation. And then when we get to the discussion activity is when we're actually going to be asking you guys to jump on board and share with us some of these areas and try to apply a lot of the concepts that we're gonna share with you here today. All right, so in terms of procurement, procurement for me is actually one of my favorite um, 
business functions within an organization. It's one of the few functions that I find really extensively touches horizontally within an organization, also vertically. It extends and allows you to explore all different elements of an organization, how the organization operates from the tactical to the strategic. But at the fundamental level, what it boils down to is really procurement is the act of obtaining goods or services for business purposes. It's very commonly referred to and associated with businesses because a lot of companies actually need to purchase services and goods and on a relatively large scale. So when we talk about procurement, um, one thing that's really held true is, you know, there's all levels of procurement. There's tactical procurement, straight up purchases, and there's strategic procurement. And where innovation really comes into play in this whole equation is when you want to really create change within an organization, when you really want to create disruption within your supply base and supply space, that's where taking strategic procurement, taking innovation and combining the two together has really proven to be very effective in the space that um, both Guillaume and I have worked with in the past. So when we look at opportunities to innovate within procurement, and this is some of the targets that we've managed to accomplish with our clients and we've worked with over the past uh, couple of years. When we look at the future of procurement, it's really, becoming an integrative business function that's optimized to help organizations connect, communicate, and collaborate within all sorts of elements of the business. So when we look at innovation and how that ties back into procurement, we're looking at identifying and sizing opportunities. So opportunities that really matter. So when you look at your organization, all of the money that you spend on a regular annual basis, where is the most effective area for you to target to really drive impact and really drive um, long-term sustainable value and commercial value for your organization? Really leveraging the procurement process and the evaluation criteria to drive organizational behavior. Every organization has its strategic objectives. If your objective is to drive better consumer engagement or if your objective is to drive uh, safer business practices, all of those things can be tied back into the evaluation process used within procurement. And now when we look at supplier relationship management, business development, those are all elements that you know we focus on when we work with businesses and organizations to look at how this ties back to an organization's goals. And so when we talk about SRM and business development, we're really looking at impacting not just your organization, but also your suppliers. And then finally, how can your organization invite, go about inviting suppliers? So expanding your reach. We know innovation comes from a pool of different thoughts, of different objectives, and comes from a lot of challenges. So making sure that you're engaging and you're constantly exploring and going out to market to find out what is new on the market. Who are those suppliers out there who've made it their life's goal and their life's passion to innovate in that specific product or that specific area that you're trying to address? Making sure that you're bringing those people into the conversation with you. That is very, very critical when we look at the future of procurement and where innovation ties in. Now. What we wanted to share with you today was really, how does this all kind of connect when we talk about sustainability? And sustainability has always had a bit of a myth in the CSR and the procurement and business world. It was up until I'd say almost a few years ago that there was still probably a prevalent myth that you know businesses didn't want to drive uh, sustainability value over business value. And you know that you have to sacrifice business value for sustainability value. This is something that we truly, truly, truly disagree with. And this, we really believe that procurement can be that bridge that brings both of those elements together. So when we look at what sustainability can do in procurement, there's a couple of different ways to look at it. And we really look at areas of influence. So one of the first things that we look at is, you know, how do we make that product that you're purchasing. If you are currently running an organization, if you are working with any sort of organization, you're spending money. You're spending money either on your services, you're spending money on your products, you're spending money on your raw materials, on your operations, on your maintenance. All of those areas are driving areas of spend for your organization. So how can you make that spend that you're currently spending with those, those suppliers more sustainable? There's a lot of things, and these are just some ideas to get you guys started. So things like requiring certifications, evaluating alternative pro products, and then really demanding visibility into ethical standards. There is a large number of organizations that I've worked with, and you're not alone in this, uh, if you feel like your organization is one of these, but where 
people don't know where their products come from. And we've seen this case study, we've seen the dangers of these types of um, supply chains where we don't actually know where our products come from. You might know where your direct immediate supplier is based out of, but if they're a reseller or a redistributor, do you really know where that product that you're purchasing comes from, how it was manufactured, whether or not it was manufactured in an ethical manner? Those are all very critical questions that you can be start to ask your product and your suppliers to start to make your product more sustainable. Now, additionally, um, we can also look at making the procurement process more sustainable. So looking at your procurement process, to look at ways to evaluate volume reduction opportunities, to really conduct life cycle assessments and to create those circular economies. We hear a lot about the latest buzzwords right now in the sustainability space is definitely circular economy. How do we create an environment where you have um, not only you're, you're creating, but you're also reusing, you're re recycling, and you're reducing. So how do we create and look at how you currently spend your process of currently driving procurement to integrate some of these functions as well? And then lastly, probably one of the best things about procurement as a function is it's actually one of the departments that integrates the most and interfaces the most of your suppliers. So really leveraging those very strong supplier relationships to make your suppliers more sustainable. You have a, a large, as large organizations, as large corporations that spend, you have the capacity and the ability to actually drive influence in your downstream supply chain. So even with your suppliers, you can work with them to incentivize things like energy efficiency, education and training programs, hiring local and diversifying their, their labor base. These are all things where when you leverage your spending power and your current procurement capabilities as an organization, you can start to drive influence in those areas. So now we really wanna share with you guys what sustainable procurement is at Etch, we really believe that you know, good knowledge, good, good ideas are not meant to be held. We want to share that out with you guys. And we really believe that every, given the alternative, everyone will want to do better and everyone will want to employ practices that will allow them to simultaneously drive business value as well as drive sustainability value. So this is our Edge sustainable procurement process. And you'll notice that it's actually just our procurement process with a little bit more green. And that's something that we like to say and we like to look at here um, within our organization. When we look at the procurement process, it follows the exact same seven steps that almost all organizations that are doing purchasing, strategic sourcing, category management are employing in their space. So, you know, we start with an assessment, we look at an opportunity, we identify the opportunity, we build a strategy to really execute on that opportunity, and then we take it into supplier negotiations, we get it contracted, we track the supplier's performance and their relationship, and then we develop process tools and trainings to continue to enhance that process. Now, what we've done here with our procurement process is actually we've integrated a step of sustainability in each of these elements. And that does two things. So firstly, it forces us to take a step back at that assessment phase. So when you're looking at your spend, so for example, if we were to take the call center spend of a large corporate bank, looking at the assessment of that spend, if you've determined at that moment that your entire call center outsourcing spend is something that is completely up for grabs and it's something that you can take out to market, at that assessment phase, what is the opportunity here from a sustainability perspective? And that's a point where you can start to ask yourself that question. Start asking yourself that question early because that's gonna drive those innovative ideas down the chain. If the question is, what is the opportunity within um, the call center outsourcing space, whether it's driving local employment, if that becomes something that your organization cares about from a strategic perspective, and that is also something that you've identified as a potential area of influence, now that's gonna shape how you go into your next stage, which is opportunity identification. Knowing that you want to drive local employment, knowing that you want to drive some job creation in areas where they need jobs, and knowing all of those things, when you're looking at your opportunity identification, you start to shape out your opportunity. So you start to shape out you know, how you're going to go to market for this, whether you're going to take all of your call center outsourcing spend out, or is there a piece of this that you could actually slice out? Because what happens in a lot of cases and with a lot of organizations when they look at 
starting to integrate sustainability into their uh, procurement process is it, it's a checkbox within an evaluation grid. And the danger with that is if we just bid out the entire call center outsourcing spend, there's no way a smaller organization, an organization that's really focused around job creation in, in an in need area is going to be able to compete at the same level as your multinationals, because there's a risk factor to the company. There's a risk factor to the organization. So when we talk about right sizing the opportunity, that's what we really mean, making sure that we're scoping this out so that it can appropriately capture and appropriately identify the opportunity to be able to influence the area that you want to influence. And moving into strategy, build and execution. Now that you've really identified your scope and you've identified how you're going to right size that opportunity, that's where you will actually start to bring in those diverse suppliers, identify those diverse suppliers, build in those additional sustainability requirements. Is it a requirement that you actually have to hire 50% of your workforce locally so that in order to win the smaller piece of the contract, whatever those requirements might be, working with your internal stakeholders, working with your internal business units to identify those very specific requirements and then executing that. So obviously taking that out to market, making sure you're getting the right suppliers involved, you're getting the right proposals back involved. And then that will allow you to assess those suppliers on an even playing field. And then of course, taking that into supplier negotiation and contracting, we all know whenever it comes to, um, establishing new contracts, establishing new suppliers, you always have a risk factor. There's always going to be a risk factor. How do you limit the risk factor? Well, by making sure you have a strong contract set up, by making sure you put in strong compliance standards when we're looking at uh, your suppliers and setting those goals and making sure that they align in the contracting phase with what you're trying to impact and what you're trying to achieve. And then finally, managing the supplier's uh, performance. So making sure that you're setting up something that you can track and you can track the supplier's performance in terms of how they are actually integrating into their, the, your current processes and into uh, what you want to achieve as far as your goals and your objectives. And taking all of those learnings, building out processes, building out tools, building out training so that you can rinse and repeat this again and again to continue to enhance your organization's procurement and to continue to enhance and make that connection between sustainability and between procurement. Now, one thing we definitely wanted to share with you guys was, you know, to show you that this is possible. This isn't just, you know, something that we made up that we think that this is very, very critical and we want to um, push out to the marketplace. This is something that's possible. We've done this before. We've done this with other clients. Both Guillaume and I have spent many years in industry working with large corporations. We currently work as a firm with large organizations, both uh, within the public space as well as the private space to put out these types of case studies, to work with them on these projects. And this is highly, highly possible when you look at opportunities. Now, a lot of the times I get conversations from, um, you know, industry folks when we start to talk and the question is always, well, it's going to take time. It takes time. The procurement process takes time. The sustainable procurement process takes even more time. And so when we look at that, it's, um, you know, is it going to take more time? Is it going to take more money? Is it going to take more expertise? And the answer to all of those questions is actually a big no, because we truly believe um, that when we look at sustainable procurement, it is 100% possible. So we wanted to share with you guys a case study that um, we we worked on a couple of years ago. So we this is a case study relating to the, the sourcing of uh, reuse of customer electronics in a large telecommunications company. So. This started with um, an organization where this category was actually buying all net new devices for clients. From, um, from the perspective of when we talk about consumer electronics, we're talking about everything that you interact with as a consumer within your house, within your house space. So whenever a new client was signed, they would get issued a net new device, any sort of return devices. We're going through a fantastic recycling program, but we're fundamentally going through a recycling program. Now, that's a function of a lot of things, things like um, customer technology, customer information protection. All of these elements are very critical. Now, what was done at the opportunities phase and the assessment phase is we actually identified an opportunity here to actually drive a reduction in waste through responsible consumption and production. And this is where the UN SDGs really came in. So we built our entire sustainable procurement process around the UN SDGs. 
and how it links back to responsible um, each of the measures of the UN SDGs to link back to your sustainable procurement process. So having identified that, we've now moved on to how do we drive this opportunity? How do we right size this opportunity? Because what's now in the marketplace? The question was not, okay, we, we think that there's a space here for reducing consumer electronics waste. Now, can we confirm that? That's a, that's, a, that's a question that's come up. So through working with uh, market research, through working with your suppliers, we were actually able to confirm that it's actually possible at this point now with the amount of evolution that's happened with technology, with information scrubbing, all of that to actually refurbish and repurpose used units for customer reuse and make sure that it's everything is sanitized, everything is scrubbed, everything is net new essentially, but you're repurposing the fundamental units themselves. So that, that was the opportunity to really drive consumer electronic waste reduction. And then from there, that drove moving into the strategy building execution phase, which really focused around ensuring supplier sustainability goals and alignment. So, you know, right sizing the opportunity, bringing in the right suppliers to who shared that same vision, who shared that same objective of reducing that waste and including the sustainability requirements in the solution design. And that fundamentally tied back into driving sustainability measures and reporting requirements for those suppliers when they actually want the agreement. That ties into our next phase, which was really supplier relationship management. This was a net new project, net new space. So we had to be very, very careful about making sure that we were tracking the pilot program very carefully. And we were scaling that up very quickly for maximized impact, but in a way that was very carefully controlled. So making sure that we implemented a robust process to ensure that sustainability criteria was met and that we were upskilling um, the warehouse team to sustain programs over time. And then finally, developing the guidelines, develop, uh, developing the training and developing the policies to make sure that that's a sustainable process. Now, that sounds like a fairly long and arduous process, but actually on our end, it actually only took um, four months from the full end-to-end -end process. And it resulted in about, about $37 million saved over 12 months and about 10,000 units refurbished each and every month. So that was the answer to a lot of the challenges that I hear all the time when we talk about sustainable procurement and when we talk about uh, what we see in our space um, for a lot of the challenges people come up to when, when they come back to, with us to say, you know, Sustainable procurement needs expertise, it needs time, and it needs more money. Well, it actually doesn't, and it actually 100% can um, address all of these elements. All right, so I know we have a couple of questions in the chat, so I would jump over to the chat quickly here um, in terms of information. So Peter, uh, you had a question around re reciprocal business with suppliers. So they buy your services and products and you buy their services and products. Absolutely. So. That those are supplier relationships that you can definitely set up. When we talk about supplier development, it's a fantastic opportunity for you to work with local suppliers. Being in um, you know, Alberta, being based out of Alberta and um, working with operations out of Alberta, we see a lot of that um, within up and coming Aboriginal spaces, but also within any supplier where you may have identified an opportunity to really support their business and making sure that, you know, we scale in a sustainable fashion. So there's a lot of technology right now. There's a lot of suppliers out there who are building um, products and building services that, uh, that, that will push the sustainability agenda in a shared space. So if that is something that your organization is interested in, it, I, think, I would say one of the first things is really open conversation and bringing them to the table for an open conversation around how innovation and how you can tie together with, um, with them in that space. Jane, if I may on that one, that brings a fantastic topic. There's a great use case uh, from the UK about a, um, a government um, institution in the UK that has a lot of confidential paperwork and the cost of paper was huge and the cost of storage and, and the destruction of these paperwork. Um, and they actually use their paper provider to recycle that paper um, into paste and then buy recycled paper from them again. So it's amazing the amount of opportunities that can be uncovered by looking at things with a sustainability lens. Um, and suppliers sometimes are the one that bring up great ideas. So again, uh, one of the main benefits was huge cost savings. The other one was being decoupled from the paper cost market because um, the recycling process was a very closed loop. 
so that's a yeah that's a fantastic thing to look into fantastic are there any other questions from uh the chat or any of the participants feel free to shoot them into the chat we do have a couple of folks here monitoring chat as well um Otherwise, we'll move into our discussion activity. Hopefully everyone's been thinking of in their minds um, a spend area that your organization does spend in. And yes, I will ask uh, if you can, please uh, turn on your cameras because we'd love to see you for this part of the participation activity. And really what we wanted to do today with this workshop is make it very um, focused towards your needs. So I know a lot of you come from organizations and you all have your own spend and your own challenges. So I'd love to hear from you Starting with the first question here, really, what are you currently buying? What is the space that you're currently buying? What is the spend space that you're currently buying that you'd be willing to share with the group here? Sorry, Jane, just to back up a minute. Um, two, two questions related to um, procurement and innovation. So there's, there's innovation in procurement and there's proc procuring innovation, which are two very different things. And one of the things that, that we see in um, and a lot of sectors, but I'll just pick on the energy sector, is that um, you know, early stage innovation can't be procured because it's not mature yet, right? It's guys working in labs and garages and stuff, and you know, they don't pass approved vendor status and they don't have your necessary insurance and all that. And so there's this mindset, especially if you're, you know, going back to VG's. Um, presentation. If you're in box one and you're trying to, you know, work on today's business and somebody's selling you, you know, or, or promoting something that, that works on sort of future business, um, th there's nothing to buy or, or the counterparty risk is so huge. And so really what you don't, you don't need a procurement, you need a partnership so that you can work with that startup or that technology developer to, to you know, iterate through the, the maturation of their technology. But oftentimes, supply chain or procurement departments aren't set up for that. They're like, okay, you're a vendor, what are you selling? And, 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 you know, and that sort of stuff. So advice on how to work around that, how to overcome that. Absolutely, absolutely. And I, that, that's a fantastic point. And that's why we go back to when we look at that assessment and we look at that integrated process, at that assessment opportunity phase, having that right-sized opportunity is so important. So when you talk about something like, for example, there's a carbon, there's a carbon recycled carbon uh, cement now. So if you look at recycled carbon cement as an example, very early stages innovation, if that's something that you're currently buying, it, it, it doesn't make sense to say, okay, let's take all of your cement spend and let's take it out to market and let's bring in this recycled carbon supplier. That doesn't work from a feasibility perspective, from a costing perspective, it's not bringing you the right returns and it's not gonna bring you your business the right returns. But having the, to right size that opportunity in terms of if there is a very specific project and I'm drawing from a construction industry project now I'm thinking of right now, where the building is itself is actually trying to meet a certain criteria in terms of lead standards or lead certifications, that might be the opportunity to actually make sure you're right sizing that. So instead of looking at, and I know procurement loves to do all this combined spend, but making sure that you're right sizing the opportunities. I do also love doing combined spend because I am from, from procurement, but it's all, when you look at things from a sustainability angle, it's about making sure that it's right size the opportunity so that you carve out the right size opportunity to allow for that growth and that partnership, as you said, with, that, with those um, very early stage on innovation suppliers. Thank you. Absolutely. Any other questions? Fantastic. Well, then I'm gonna ask somebody, a brave soul within the audience <laughs> to raise your hand. And uh, if you're willing to share, you can, you can message it in chat. If you don't want anyone to know who you are, you can message it directly to us and we can help you, uh, we, can share the, we can share the spend space. Otherwise, I can, we'll, we can do this exercise and we can draw from one of the other case examples that we performed as well. Maybe while people are thinking about their example, I can just react quickly uh, to Kevin's point. It's what we really believe in. It's all about getting started. And what Jane described as that, you know, right sizing, it's really that if you see innovation that you want to bring in and support or test out, that's what the world needs. People are ready to take these pilots to market, people trying these things. Uh, maybe it works out, maybe it doesn't. But if it does, integrating it into procurement and requirements moving forward uh, of your products and services is what is going to change the world in a little step by little step. Fantastic. 
All right, I think we've got a fairly shy group here. So what we'll do is we'll take one of the examples from um, our one of the industry uh, presentations that we've done earlier this year. And it's one very common one when it comes to businesses. So we've heard about the technology evolution and the actually it ties to today's COVID example as well. So with everything happening within COVID, there's there was still a large number of businesses that were actually operating off of uh, Word documents, physical printed documents, physical printed legal documents, physically printed contracts, things like that. So that was actually one spend that space that almost every organization has printing your print spend. So. When we look at it from the perspective of that print spend, starting with the assessment phase, you know, is there a way that we can buy less of the print? Can we use it in a more sustainable fashion before disposing it? Are people actually using their printing correctly? And these are all questions that we started to ask. And if you look at the evolution of innovation, and I, I know um, there's been a lot of fantastic um, knowledge shared about that today already, but Starting with the phase step of, is there a way that we can actually be limiting how people are printing? How do we change people's printing behavior? Is that something that we want to be doing? And then moving to something like digital documentation, where you actually end up completely reducing your print spend, completely re reducing the print material. That is something that in today's COVID-2019 environment, where um, there, there's, I've seen it personally with a lot of our clients where we had printed POs, we were working with printed POs, printed documents, things like that, that were suddenly pushed. And these innovations of technology, of uh, DocuSign, of um, digital signatures, e-signatures, e-stamps, all of these things came into fu full force because people couldn't be in the marketplace. But then here's the question. It's, could we have analyzed that spend? Could we have brought that into this space much earlier on? Could we have had a um, much more direct and more strategic approach to actually scaling back our physical printing and bringing more of that uh, digital, digital technology and leveraging it in a way that is integrated within our processes instead of being having our hands forced immediately? Because that's the big thing with sustainability as we start to move forward into looking forward into the new world is there is going to be change that's driven because of sustainability. There is going to be change driven because of sustainable consumer consumption patterns. And as we continue to push into those areas, that is where we start to see, you know, will you be part of the people who were proactive and started to make those changes in advance? Or will you be part of the people who were forced essentially by the natural circumstances around them and then by the industry and the influences around them? So Terry, we got a question here from yourself. How, what about getting ready for ESG demands? Definitely. So, I mean, when it comes to where the industry is moving as far as ESG demands, we know we are seeing consumers have a larger and larger outcry for um, measures, for more of these measures to be reported, to be captured, um, for people to be, for organizations to be able to demonstrate uh, you know, how they're, they're adjusting to the sustainable world. And one really easy example to share with you guys, and I think everyone's experienced it, is five years ago, you would go into a coffee shop and we probably would not see any sort of, um, oh, here's a reusable straw, paper straws, and the, you know, all of these disposable types of labels, these disposable types of um, uh, certifications. And so, that is something that the consumer space has pushed and has moved as far as consumer change behavior, buying behavior has changed and evolved. So that's now forced businesses and organizations to adjust how they procure and how the kind of materials that they procure. If you look at how Starbucks has changed their procurement model and how they've changed their packaging procurement model, it's evolved significantly over time um, to account for a lot of these, um, a lot of these measures and a lot of these, uh, these metrics. All right. Well, in terms of what else that we can be doing to become more sustainable, I mean, we really wanted this, and I do encourage you guys to speak up, to send a message over into the chat because we'd love to share with you guys, you know, let's let's explore this activity from the perspective of something that you guys are currently um, buying and uh, an industry that you guys are currently spending on. So one of the areas that I know we had started to give you guys as an example, and this is uh, 
this is to do with call centers and um, call center job creation in South Africa. So we talked a little bit about um, our organization in terms of working with with uh, organizations in terms of job creation in Africa. So there are there are call center outsourcing establishments in places like Africa, places like India, where, you know, really there's organizations that are really trying to create jobs and trying to create job incentives and working with those organizations and answering these questions in terms of how you can be leveraging, how you can be leveraging your spend to drive those supplier incentives and to work with those suppliers and partner with them to drive job creation in that space. So one thing I will share with you guys, because, um, we, we are having a fairly quiet group here, is when, when it comes to leveraging um, sustainability, when it comes to leveraging sustainability within your procurement process, but also within um, what's happening today in, in procurement, we're in a space right now with COVID-19 where, and this is probably very relevant to today's environment, um, we're now at the second wave and we're all kind of experiencing it. We can tell it right now because we're all here now virtually and digitally within our space. And there are multiple organizations that are working with directly with um, frontline workers to satisfy um, those PPE requirements. So when we look at what the healthcare department has gone through in terms of um, PPE and procurement procurement um, procurement of PPE for frontline workers, it's followed a very similar trend. So I know we had a question earlier around, you know, working with suppliers, how do we work on supplier development? How do we innovate with suppliers? So at the very beginning of the COVID-19 crisis, there was a supply shortage. And that is a problem that really um, was very apparent as far as North America went uh, in, and really globally across all of the world. We saw mass prices surge. We saw organizations really um, struggle with a lot of, with procurement, with procuring this, uh, the right PPE. So how were we able to innovate? How is procurement able to innovate to address challenges within that space? And that's where uh, organizations like ourselves, we actually ended up getting involved with um, a lot of organizations that were working with frontline workers to innovate in terms of finding the right suppliers. And you see suppliers shifting as well uh, from suppliers that were providing, uh, providing uh, al from alcohol producers to providing hand sanitizer and, and um, suppliers that were manufacturing clothing to becoming a mass manufacturer. So working with suppliers to really drive that innovation and that sustainability within that marketplace becomes super, super critical. Yeah, I, I want to jump on that, Jane. Working with suppliers is a fantastic opportunity. You do not want to underestimate the programs they might have in place. Sometimes, you know, in other countries that they're operating in, um, they can bring ideas you don't have already just because you didn't ask. And that is a fantastic way to get started as well and get thinking out of the box and out of the usual process, what's already in place. Um, again, that, that uh, paper um, closed loop idea uh, came from the supplier to address not only cost savings, but also that uh, recycling aspect. There are a lot of, of, of um, examples like that all across the board of working with suppliers and they bring ideas, just like they bring you a lot of information if you ask about their market. Can I ask a question, uh, Jane? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so I, I, in one of the previous presentations, Wally talked about taking the red pill as a metaphor for buying into the corporate innovation. All right, we're going after it. One of you might be able to talk a little bit about that sort of red pill moment and kind of building up what Guillaume was saying about sort of like realizing that suppliers might have incentives or some other things. But I'm asking more about like, what are some of the, you know, the things that you've seen that have revealed themselves as red pill moments for customer or clients working in this space um, on sustainable procurement? And, um, and what has been, in, what's your take on things that are actually stopping people who should be popping the red pill, but continue to pop the blue pill? I would say definitely those three myths that I talked about at the very uh, at the earlier onset, Terry. There's a ton of organizations out there that right now just want to get started, and I, I firmly believe that you know for organizations that want to get started with sustainable procurement, it, it's really just about providing them with the how and showing them that they can be done. 
there is um, those three myths are very common, uh, I think, objections and why organizations continue to take uh, the blue pill there because they we hear a lot of uh, organizations come back and say, you know, we think that, you know, we'd love to go down the sustainable procurement objective, but going back to an example of recycled carbon cement. Well, you know, that's going to be more expensive. That's going to be uh, more costly. That's going to be more time consuming. All of those elements um, have been tied back and have been drilled into people's minds, weirdly enough, as this kind of prevalating myth when it comes to sustainability and corporate innovation to really say, mm -hmm. okay, well, you know, if we want to go and invest more in CSR, if we want to invest more in sustainability, it's going to cost our organization more money. It's going to cost us more, more money, more time, and it's going to cost us more as a, as a whole and as a unit. So when we look at that space, I think those are some of the three big myths. And that's why, you know, for us, we really want to make sure that, you know, we're sharing this out. And the most important thing I think for any organization to think about it in the space is like, they have to try it. You just have to try it once and to really start to engage with it, to really get hooked on it, because that's going to be your red pill moment. When you first take off the gloves and just take these processes back and just apply it within your organization. The first time that you look at your spend and instead of saying, okay, I've got this contract up for renewal, I'm about to take it into, I'm gonna renew it. Do I take it out to marketplace? I'm gonna apply the exact same process I've always done. By adding that layer of green, it forces you to take a step back and really look at things from a perspective of, can I innovate here? Can I push myself to innovate a little bit more so that we drive change, not just from a sustainability perspective, but also from a corporate value perspective. Because it ultimately speaking, every single business value or business process, business function has to drive value from a business value perspective in order for the business itself to be sustainable. Mm -hmm. So we really want to make sure that it's driven from both ends. I wonder too, I, I don't know if anybody in the audience is funny, wants to sort of chip in on this uh, or chime in on this. But, uh, you know, I'll be interested in their thoughts, too, about what, you know, what are what are their sort of struggles in terms of thinking about how to get started, why to get started, the value prop of getting started and all these other other things as well. So if anybody in the audience wants to to chime in and, and see what um, comment on whether those myths are accurate or whether there's some other reason to think about. And what we'll do is actually we'll stop sharing the slides and so we can actually see everyone and please do feel free to turn on your cameras don't be shy and we really want this to be a discussion topic to really focus on some of your challenges that you might be going through within your organization or even just brainstorm ideas for how you can take this back and apply this within your within your space mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. have you had, had any um, unexpected benefits or anything that's come out of any of the work that you've done that's been something that wasn't anticipated to be a benefit at the start that ended up playing out to be something, you know, lemonade out of the lemons? <laughs> Absolutely. So I think one of the big things, um, and G, maybe uh, you have an example here and that you'd like to share um, following this this example here but you know one of one of the organizations that we've dealt with um, I mean when we look at data centers on data center operations and operations of data centers when you outsource your data center maintenance and you outsource your data center operations there's a lot of factors that play into that in terms of your energy consumption and almost every every single organization within today's digital space does at some point in time um, have a lot of their data hosted within data centers. So looking at how data center hosting is performed, we started look, by looking at um, the, you know, a total cost of ownership when it comes to you know, not just what you're housing and the services that you're housing, but also um, things like energy consumption, because those are your secondary cost influences. So you might have your direct cost influences that are tied back to the data center, but also your secondary cost influences of the amount of energy your data centers are consuming and elements such as that. So how do we actually reduce your total cost of ownership and um, actually target areas where you don't want to squeeze your suppliers. You, do, you never want to put your suppliers into a position where they themselves feel like they're being targeted or their margins are being squeezed to a point where they can't operate. You want to work with your suppliers together to come up with innovative solutions to potentially reduce your total cost of operations to drive for additional um, cost savings and cost reduction opportunities within your business value. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it's a 
also about recognizing it. I mean, whatever we're doing in the procurement space can have and sometimes has as a byproduct a sustainability impact. And that's what we need to train ourselves to recognize. And from there, innovation will stem as well because we start thinking about it a different way and start seeing new opportunities. Again, as Jane said, within the same scope we have today in terms of expertise, budget, resources. It is possible, it's all about getting started. And we see it a lot when people start opening their eyes and say, oh, right, we had that as a project or we, we didn't think about that, or oh, we have that as uh, part of our process, all we have to do is expand on it. It's really recognizing it and getting started. And especially in the procurement space for us, we have so much potential, so much power down the line when we negotiate contract with suppliers to actually impact not only our little deal, but also behavior down the supply chain. And that's really something that any corporation, any organization can do by really getting started. We're back to the red pin now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what role, sorry to, to, to monopolize the, the, the questions here for a second, but I'm curious though too about what role sort of institutional incentives might play, you know, because, you know, you may have an intrinsic reason of wanting to be sustainable for, for your own reasons, but then there's also the, the idea that you can capture some aspect of the performance and use it for, again, the sustainable finance angle or other kinds of other kinds of credits or some things like that. What role are those playing and where are those trending now? Well, that's a, that's a very, very broad question. I, I can see a couple of uh, starting points here. Uh, 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 we are so lucky to be operating in Canada where the population and the government are supportive and driving the agenda um, and, and where all these things are possible. You can find financial support. Uh, your population is going to be receptive. You have programs in place that you can bring back to the, to the market. And, and we're in 2020. Like it should not even be technically a big consideration. We should be doing it, especially if we have the capacity to do it within our current scope and cap capabilities. Um, you know, we should get out there and find innovative ways to uh, work in a more sustainable way. And that doesn't mean everything at the same time. Again, it's all about getting started. We can get the grant, we can get uh, great research, great support. Um, that, that's really where it starts. Hmm. I think it's an interesting, um, I think it's definitely an interesting space because you right now is where you're seeing like those types of incentives are trying to drive people to get started. And really, I think that's the big thing. Um, that's the biggest challenge that sustainable procurement and really sustainable innovation when in this space is faced with. It's really getting someone started into this space, having somebody to say, okay, I want to explore you know, my space here is a specific spend area that I think can be something that we can start to look at. And how do we look at it from the angle and the lens of sustainability? Whether it's here's some operation spend, here's some, here's some product spend, here is some maintenance spend, whatever that might be, getting somebody to actually say, okay, I'm going to take a step and I'm going to change how I actively look at my spend and how I actively look at how I spend my suppliers and trying to apply the process to prove that it works because it's really about that. I mean, we can see in the organizations and even in the companies that we, we work with um, right now, it's hard for people to start to say, I want to make that adjustment and add that layer of green and add that different angle and add that lens of sustainability in there. Because, you know, it's already hard enough getting um, folks to come to the table to say, okay, we want to engage procurement and we want to engage procurement to come and help us drive innovation in our products. Because there is that assumption that there is most of the time it's going to be tactical. It's going to be, um, time consuming or all of those other elements that we talked about but really it's it's just about getting started and once you get started you do your first project you're going to be able to create those measurable tangible results that's going to tie back into your corporate value creation and your sustainable value creation hmm. thank you all right and we got no. another question here so sorry terry no no it's just same thing the question in the chat Perfect. So how would procurement get impacted due to changes related to the new fourth industrialization discussed earlier today? So the, as far as um, changes related to the first industri industrialization, I think really procurement is that business function that's tied very deeply within um, organizations, within businesses, within organizations. So 
tying back all of the impacts that were really shared uh, that really tie back to the fourth industrialization when it comes to the innovation that's going to be required, the changes that are going to be required, the different mentality, the shifts that need to be driven. Procurement is just as much influenced by it, and it's really a support function to the organization. So as organizations go through the shift, as organizations go through, through this change, procurement itself will need to adjust and shift to be able to support and drive the same objectives um, in this space. And, and if technology and automation enable procurement to get rid of some more tactical phases, then everybody in the space will be able to grow into a more strategic view. And we all know that once the kind of operational tactical negotiations and low hanging fruits and, and sustainable uh, programs are in place, everything shifts to more strategic category management, but also risk management, your supply chain, your, your down the line, your routes, your carriers, um, mitigation of weather events um, and, and other catastrophes that happens, you know, on the yearly basis these days, um, that all of that will still require um, thought process and taking a step back. And all these things are enabling people to take that step back for some time and think. Absolutely. Well, are there any other questions from anyone within the space here? If not, then Terry, what I can do is I can hand it back to yourself and uh, we can close it off. Okay, we can work off from there. All right, um, last chance, okay. So I wanna thank Jane, Guillaume, Calvin and the rest of the team from Edge for, for an interesting and, and I think a very pragmatic and very real red pill opportunity for companies to learn how to become more sustainable, but also, again, sort of flex their innovation, corporate innovation muscles by trying to do things different on a continuous basis. And that, that has a, a, lot of, a lot of value, even just from the, the, the learning about becoming a more flexible organization. I uh, want to remind everybody that this event um, will be, the video for this will be made available. Um, we have a survey that we'd like you to complete, and that will show up in the chat in a few moments. Um, also want to recognize that uh, if you want to get in touch with Jane or Guillaume for further conversations, um, I think their contact information was on the, um, where do we get your contact information, Jane? Best way to get in touch with you. And, you know. I have a variety of the slides with this, uh, from this presentation as well that you're free to distribute as well. And then of course you can um, always find us on LinkedIn, on, the, <laughs> on our websites, we're everywhere. Wonderful, thank you. Um, I want to thank all everybody in the audience today for participating and for um, listening to this presentation. It's been a very long, very content rich day. I know that we've got, uh, we've had a lot to think about today. Um, and we're really grateful that you made uh, the time to spend uh, with us today. I'd also, again, a big heartfelt uh, thank you to the Haskin staff who put in a lot of work into today and uh, have pushed it over the finish line in style. Really appreciate all the work that you guys have done. Um, that pretty much draws the uh, session to a close. And uh, there will be some follow-up um, documentation that we'll be sending on to you, which will have links to all the presentations that are available, a link to all of the videos, as well as information. If anybody's interested in working in that masterclass with VJ, uh, there'll be information for in there as well. And with that, again, thank you all for joining us for Corporate Innovation Day. Stay safe, and we'll see you soon. Thank you.